Hi everyone, my name is Katrina Sewis and I'm a Curator of Digital Programming here and Compliance Officer at Operation Owner's Voice. And this is our Lunchtime Talks program where we invite people in to speak about the wider issues that um, Operation Owner's Voice is interested in exploring. And it is our great pleasure and privilege to welcome some amazing, amazing speakers today. We have Peter Gagan. From well, Open Democracy and Adam Ramsey. And uh, Peter's going to speak for about 30 minutes, um, followed by time for questioning, uh, around some of the work that Open Democracy has been doing around uh, the uh, 2016 referendum and um, various questions that are emerging from that. And then Adam will speak for 25 to 30 minutes as well, doing a deep dive, followed by questions. Um, Let's just take it away. Let's just take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks, William, for having us. Thanks, uh, Katrina. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to talk through some of. I'm the investigations editor at Open Rocks UK, and I'm going to talk through some of our investigations. Apologies if I sound nasally. I've got a bit of annoying head cold, so, but I will continue to plough forward. Um, I, I'm really surprised that it's like kind of the start of 2019 and I'm still talking about some of this stuff. Uh, some of the stuff I, I was talking about today I started doing about two years ago. I would have assumed I would have stopped doing it about 18 months ago, but it's kind of continued on. And I was just having my, uh, my lunch today, uh, my breakfast uh, before I came out, and uh, I was sitting in a cafe in Bethel Green, and I was listening to three people next to me, and they were all talking about, some of you might have seen this Brexit, the Uncivil Award of uh, film that was on the other night with Benedict Cumberbatch. But they were talking about what the Leave campaign were doing, they were talking about data, they were talking about Cambridge Analytica, and I just thought it was really interesting, this kind of stuff that had been really marginal, I think, two and a half years ago. I think more and more people are thinking and talking about it, and you know, one of the people there was like, well, what does it matter, this stuff's always happening, and somebody else was saying, well, well, no, we didn't know this was happening before, and we don't know what it's going to do in the future, and I think that's the really interesting thing. So today I'll talk to you a lot about specifics of investigative stories we did around Brexit, and I'll talk to you about like, what we discovered, and the nuts and bolts of it, but I think there's also a bigger question, and a bigger story about uh, data and politics, and, and data in the world that we live in, and how narratives, and how uh, uh, kind of narratives travel in ways I think are uncertain, and uh, are, aren't necessarily predetermined. So, yeah, that's kind of the backdrop to some of this. But I'm going to talk you through uh, what we call our dark money investigations. And dark money is uh, it was my boss who first used that, uh, kind of introduced me almost to the, the, the phrase dark money. It kind of comes from America. There's a book called, by a woman called Jane Mayer, who writes from New Yorker a lot, and she wrote about dark money. And basically, it means money that is in the political system that you don't know where it comes from. Uh, it happens a lot in the States because they have this thing called Citizens United and uh, basically it's possible to create these things around a herd called super PACs where you can put money into the political system you know where it comes from. And kind of some of the work that we've been doing around Brexit is kind of looking at something similar that seems to have happened in the United Kingdom around the Brexit referendum. And the first big story that myself and my colleague here Adam did, which is about two years ago, it was a story about the Democratic Unionist Party, which is a political party, I'm, I might be able to tell it from my accent, I'm from Ireland, uh, and I lived in Belfast for many years, so I was quite uh, old favourite with the DUP, but it seemed that actually nobody in Britain had ever heard of them until about, eight, uh, about two years ago in the general election. So, oh my God, who are the DUP? Um, uh, so, I kind of heard them before that, and uh, the DUP, um, based on myself and Adam, um, Adam rang me up one day, going, I'm really interested in the Democratic Unions Party and this Brexit referendum and the money that they were spending, because Adam took this photo from Edinburgh uh, just before the referendum, and it's, it's pretty grainy, but these photographs, at the bottom it says, paid for and distributed by uh, Geoffrey Donaldson for the Democratic Unionist Party. Um, and at the same time, I'd been covering the uh, Brexit referendum as well for the Irish Times, and I'd noticed these huge big adverts in the Metro uh, for the DUP as well, which came out about two days before the Brexit vote. So they bought these massive, you can see it's a DUP's logo, and vote leave, take back control. And what is interesting with the Metro is the Metro doesn't even circulate in Northern Ireland. Uh, it only circulates in, in GB. Uh, so the DUP had spent a load of money on this. So myself and Adam uh, wrote a big story uh, looking at how the DUP is spending in the Brexit referendum. Um, and the thing about, what's interesting about this is that under um, electoral law in Northern Ireland, uh, to do with the Troubles, political donations are secret. So you don't know who, who pays for political donations in Northern Ireland. That's changed now partly on the back of some of the work we've done, political donations in Northern Ireland are no longer secret, but they were for many, many years. Um, and so that means you can't, actually, if somebody who knows about political donation in Northern Ireland tells you about it, they can face up to six months in prison, uh, which is kind of remarkable, um, if they, if they uh, divulge information to the political donations in Northern Ireland. So we wrote uh, a series of stories looking at this, 
Um, uh, we found that it was actually the donation was for four hundred thirty-five thousand pounds, which is by far and away the biggest donation in history of Northern Ireland. For the general election campaign in 2015, DUP spent like 50 grand. There's not much money in Northern Irish politics. Uh, there's guns, but not much money. Um, and so this was a huge, big donation. So we started looking, looking into it more and more, uh, trying to find out you know, where this money had come from. Um, and around the same time when we started looking at this, there was a snap, general, a snap election for the Stormont Assembly, uh, the now in abeyance Stormont Assembly in Belfast. Um, and we were able to kind of almost forced the DUP to kind of say where some of this money had come from and um, to find out exactly how much it was. It was actually £435,000 uh, in total and it came from a small group called the Constitutional Research Council which is run out of a semi-detached house in the outskirts of Glasgow. Actually, and I happen to live in Glasgow. Um, and it's run by a man called Richard Cook who was a former uh, Conservative Party general election candidate in the early 2000s. And we started looking at Mr. Richard Cook and we discovered that he'd set up a company uh, back in the day with a man called Prince um, Nawaf uh, bin Abdul Aziz Al Saud, who's also better known as a former head of Saudi secret intelligence, uh, and a man called Peter Houstrup, who'd been involved with gun running in India in the 1980s. Uh, so it was quite, a, quite an odd character. Uh, we continued to follow this story. I, I published a really long piece at the weekend, which was looking at Richard Cook's waste management company, which had been involved in kind of... Uh, left kind of a trail of debt, of illegal waste shipments around the world and of a uh, regulatory concern. He'd been brought before court in California and turned up and been fined $1.5 million, him and his company, for failing to pay UPS. So there's just a kind of a, a sense of this, this man not really knowing uh, who he is or w what he's up to. And this is the only person that we know was involved in the DP donation. So it's two and a half years later, and uh, this donation of almost half a million pounds, all of it, almost all of which was spent in GB, not in Northern Ireland. Uh, we still don't know where this money came from. You know, where, where, did this, where did this cash come from? So that was kind of the first big story we did looking at the Brexit referendum, kind of thinking about, well, where's, where is the money that's coming in for this? Because, you know, the, the referendum, if you, I remember covering as a journalist, uh, it was so full on, things were happening every day, it was really hard to keep track of things. And you'd go out into the world and people were telling you about things that they'd read online or they were talking about stuff that they'd seen on the internet or stuff they'd seen in the newspaper, but it was really hard to keep track of it. And one of the things I think we've tried to do over the last couple of years is to try and understand what actually happened during the referendum campaign and also how it influences what's happening now. So, you know, for example, like the DUP are uh, propping up the, the government at the moment. Their 10 votes are completely, they have a confidence supply deal with the Conservative Party and they are integral to the future of the United Kingdom. Them. Whether they vote for Theresa May's withdrawal deal with the European Union on Tuesday will be very significant, and we still don't know where a significant amount of the money that came from the Brexit for their Brexit referendum spending came from, and that's still legal because there's no um, donor. There is donor transparency now exists in Northern Ireland. The legislation existed from January 2014, but um, rather than enact it, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland decided to only bring in transparency from July 2017. So basically, it meant that this donation isn't covered. So we still don't know where the money came from. And so we've been kind of continuing to try and find out. Uh, and one of the other things, the interesting things with this story as well, is that you know the Electoral Commission, which is the body that's supposed to oversee um, the Electoral Commission is the body supposed to oversee the electoral process in the United Kingdom. You know, we've been, at various times, I've often been asking the Electoral Commission, you know, what's happened with this? Can you explain more about this donation? And they said they can't because of these, these laws. They could face six months in prison. But also, you know, in general, in a lot of the work we do, you see that we, we have regulatory systems. You know, the Information Commissioner's Office, we have the Advertising Standards Agency, we have the Electoral Commission, we have the Charities Commission, for loads of different things. There's, there's, there is a regulatory process. And the idea is that the regulatory process is supposed to stop people doing things they're not supposed to do. It's supposed to catch them, it's supposed to punish them, uh, and it's supposed to act as a deterrent for people, you know, to keep people on the straight and narrow. And what I found throughout our work over the last couple of years is, is that time and time again the regulatory system just isn't really fit for purpose. Uh, if you are, if you're, you know, if, so, if you're somebody who wants to get around regulation, it's not that hard to do. You know, you can, you can take advantage of loopholes like donor secrecy in Northern Ireland, but not just that, you often have regulators who are understaffed, who have uh, quite weak powers. The Electoral Commission's maximum fine is £20,000. You know, if this, which is nothing really, if you consider it was about fourteen million pounds spent by each side during the Brexit referendum. So you know, it's a drop in the ocean. So what's the, there isn't a huge deterrent for something like that. Um, so you've probably heard a bit about Vote Leave. Um, Vote Leave was the official uh, le designated campaign during the Brexit referendum, and they could spend up to seven million pounds. So all the other non-official campaigns could spend up to seven hundred thousand pounds. So the DUP could spend up to seven hundred thousand pounds. 
Um, vote Leave uh, spent, I think, I can't remember exactly how much this was, but they were like, they spent about some 6.9 dot, 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 dot million. They came really, 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 really close, like a couple of hundred quid away from spending seven million pounds. They just managed not to spend seven million, just by, somehow, just by chance. Um, and one of the things I got interested in when I was looking through all this spending was, in about a week before the referendum, uh, Vote Leave um, spent si about £675,000, so almost £700,000, on a uh, campaign led by this man, Darren Grimes. You might, some of you might have seen more recently. Um, what's really strange with this still is, actually, I was on this same edition of Channel 4 News that he was on. I had no idea who he was at the time. It's from about two and a half years ago. I was talking about, I'd written a book about politics in Scotland, and we were talking about young people voting. Um, but, so, he'd been, uh, Darren Grimes had set up this small little campaign called Be Leave. He'd had a Twitter account, a Facebook page, you know, Young People for Leave. And he'd raised uh, the princely sum of £107 between uh, January and early June 2017. And then in the last three weeks of the referendum, miraculously, he got £675,000. And initially, the Electoral Commission looked at this and said that there was no need to investigate. It was, it looked, it was something that they, you know, it's okay, it's not a big problem. It's fine, nothing to see here. Uh, and I'd F I got FOI's uh, Freedom of Information Request, which is one of the things I use as a journalist quite a lot. And I got all of the internal e email correspondence for the Electoral Commission. And the Electoral Commission are kind of uh, saying, like, the Electoral Commission internally are kind of asking themselves, What's, what can we do with this? Is this okay? And they say, it's actually, this is really highly unusual, but we're not going to, we're not going to investigate it. Um, and then when I published this story on the back of this, Jolie Mom, who's a QC based here in London, he runs a thing called the Good Law Project, and they decided they were going to uh, try and issue what's called a judicial review against, uh, against the Electoral Commission about their failure to investigate vote leave spending. So the Electoral Commission then said, oh, rather than, rather than have this, we're going to investigate again. Uh, so having initially looked at this, the Electoral Commission said nothing to see here. They then investigated uh, Darren Grimes' £675,000. And one of the strange things about £675,000 was it was never even resting in Darren Grimes' bank account. It was actually spent purely on his behalf by Vote Leave with a company called Aggregate IQ, who some of you might have heard of, which is a Canadian company based in British Columbia. The Leave campaigns in, in general spent almost £4 million with this company. The company had no website had no phone number and no one had ever heard of and we're in a, a room that looked a bit like this and about as big as this in British Columbia. So somehow, we don't know how, they were discovered and they were uh, headed by the, uh, the Leave campaign, paid them to work with them. But they also paid £675,000 on Darren Grimes' behalf uh, to Aggregate IQ. Um, and under British electoral law, if you do something like that, it's what's called coordinated campaigning and you have to declare this as separate. You know, it sounds a bit technical, but basically the idea is it, you're not supposed to be able to set up a bunch of different groups. There's a reason why we have spending limits. So if you're seven million pounds spending limit, you're not supposed to set up 20 other groups who can all spend 700,000 pounds and give them money as well, because, well, that kind of defeats the purpose of having a spending limit. Um, and it was really remarkable the Electoral Commission thought this was okay for so long. Like, for a year and a half, they were like, there's nothing untoward about the big campaign vote leave spending money purely on this man, Darren Grimes' account, without him even seeing the money. And we know now from work that Carol Cadwaller, who's done great work on this as well, I'm sure you all know who she is, that The Guardian and The Observer has done, you know, Shamir Sani, who was also on, on Vote Leave, he was asking Darren Grimes, can we not, because like, they were working for free, can we not get our train fares reimbursed, now we've got this £675, and, and Darren apparently said, well, no, we don't, because we can't, that's actually not our money. Um, and so eventually the Electoral Commission decided to open an investigation. Uh, and they fined Vote Leave and they reported, uh, they reported him to police and they also fined Darren Grimes and reported him to the Met Police. And they found that the elect that Vote Leave had broken the elect electoral law, which is quite a striking thing. It took them two years to find this out, but you know, that's, it's a major plank of, of our referendum, you know, was, was the Leave campaign and they, they broke the law. Um, it's interesting if you look at what's happening in America, Michael Cohn and the Trump campaign. So Michael Cohn was Donald Trump's lawyer, and the accusation in America is that he was involved with spending, uh, paying off this woman, Stormy Daniels, who's a porn star, and that is a federal crime. Uh, breaking electoral law in the United States is a federal crime. It's a really serious thing to do. It's probably the most serious threat that's hanging over Donald Trump is this breaking electoral law. Whereas the United Kingdom, you get fined. I think vote leave were fined. They broke. They were found to have broken the law four in four different instances. So they got fined seventy thousand pounds. So what's 
70, someone who's better at maths than me, £70,000 from, from a total of £7 million spent. Was that one one thousand? Am I right in that? Uh, you know, it's, it's a fraction. It's a fraction of the overall spending. Uh, so, it's, you know, it's not really exactly a deterrent. And there was very little conversation. I thought it was really interesting in the UK. There was almost no conversation about, oh, wow, the Leave campaign has broken the law. Does that mean we should talk about why the things that happened? Um, and so speak, and the other interesting thing, if you're interested in data and stuff, what we also know now is that the Leave campaign, and you might have noticed this if you, if you watched uh, the Brexit and Civil War the other day, the Leave campaign spent a lot of money online in the, in the last few days. And the difference, in, and there's a lot of ads going up on Facebook in particular. They, they, I think about 60 million, there was about 60 million uh, views of, um, of Facebook ads produced by the Leave campaign. And the interesting thing with the Facebook ads was they were markedly different from the tone of the Leave campaign's wider uh, advertisements. You know, if you, if you go back, you'll, and I'll talk about Aaron, Aaron Banks in a few minutes, but there was Vote Leave and there was Leave.eu, and Vote Leave was kind of the conservative, why broadly the conservatives for leaving the European Union. They talked about economics, they talked about sovereignty, and they left talking about immigration to leave.eu. But these were the kind of ads that were actually going up on Facebook. And a lot of people didn't know this. It was really interesting as a journalist who covered the campaign. I was meeting people who were talking about Turkey. I was in the northeast of England. And I was like meeting people talking about Turkey's going to join the EU. And I found out, I was like, why do you think Turkey's going to join the EU? Like, that's not going to happen. Uh, and it's not that surprising. They were seeing these kind of adverts. Turkey's joining the EU. Is it a good idea? You know, no, Turkey's not joining the EU. And there's no, at the moment, we have no records. They, we only have these adverts because um, Vote Leave actually gave them to the, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, Select Committee's investigation to fake news. So Vote Leave actually gave these adverts up, uh, belatedly, about, well, about three or four months ago. Um, but other campaigns have not given up their adverts. Leave.eu have never revealed. So we don't know what people were seeing. Um, we also know they ran this campaign uh, to, get peop to harvest people's email addresses. Win £50 million pounds predicting, uh, predicting, the uh, the, well, uh, predicting the European Championship. Sounds a great thing. Have a goal. Free money. Um, you have to predict the correct score in every single game in the European Championships. I think the odds are something like, f it's a five trillion to one? It's, you know, absolutely, you know, uh, it's a banker. They were never going to pay up on it. But you've got email addresses, which is really useful. Email addresses allow you to target people, both with advertising, but also allows you to use other data alongside it. And the big difference in the Leave the Brexit referendum and kind of traditional campaigning as well is that you know in, during traditional campaigns there's also there is a kind of inbuilt during like a general election there's an inbuilt um, there's a kind of a there's there's always been an inbuilt timidity in the political system because the political parties will be standing for election again where you know they, they will have to they, you know the conservative have, have the conservatives have an ongoing case in Tanit South to do with electoral. Uh, breaking electoral law in their campaigns in 2015. It doesn't look good, but the leave, the, these campaigns, Remain and Leave, just disappeared the day after the referendum. So there's not this, so people were, there was a kind of, um, it was easier to just say things because you weren't really going to have to be held to account for them. And speaking of saying things and not be held for account for them, here is uh, Aaron Banks. You might, some of you might have seen this photograph before. This is Aaron Banks here. You might know who he is, uh, Nigel Farage, Andy Wigmore, um, and Raheem Kassam. And Aaron Banks is the guy who spent, um, it's actually hard to figure out exactly how much money he spent on Brexit. Somewhere between 10 and 14 million pounds uh, on the Brexit referendum. Um, and we at Open Democracy have done a lot of work on Aaron Banks over the last couple of years. And, and journalistically, I thought it was quite interesting because this guy spent all this money and there wasn't much questions about him for a long time after the vote. Most people, I think, until very recently, probably hadn't even heard of him. Um, does, does everybody know who he is? He's a, he's a self-described insurance mogul uh, based in Bristol. Um, he, uh, he likes to kind of... Uh, he was involved with UKIP. He was kind of the first... He kind of spent... He's originally a Tory uh, council candidate many years ago and then became involved with UKIP and then was heavily involved with bankrolling uh, the Brexit referendum. And he set up a thing called Leave.eu, him and Nigel Farage. And um, one of the things we started doing was like, just asking, like, well, where, did Aaron Banks, where did Aaron Banks get all this money to spend on the Brexit referendum? Because you know, I got interested in, in him just during the campaign, really, and reading about him. I was like, who is this guy? I've never really heard of him before. And it's very unusual. Like, you know, in the, like ten, the amount he, he spent more money on this campaign than anyone's ever spent on any political, uh, on, any, on any election or anything in Britain. You know, and people, people generally don't spend 10 to 14 million pounds on, on a, a political campaign in the UK. It's a huge amount of money. It's, we are still actually, thankfully, a bit behind the United States in terms of the amount of money that goes into our politics. And the interesting thing with Aaron Banks is it's really hard to get a handle on how much money is actually worth. So, yeah, and there's a thing with journalism sometimes where 
one person cites a number and then it becomes just the accepted number and it goes around and around and around. Um, and so a lot of people said that banks was worth between 100 and 250 million pounds. And that got me wondering, so say he was worth 150 million as a kind of a ballpark. Then he spent around 10% of his entire value on the Brexit referendum. That's a lot of money. He's probably not liquid for all of that. So you're kind of starting to go, you know, how could you afford this? So we started looking into his finances and, and started asking these kind of questions about, well, where did this money actually come from? Uh, and we found a lot, a lot of questions to be asked, actually. If you look into his, and the Financial Times done a lot of good work on this as well. If you look into his, actually, his companies, their profitability, it's very hard to see how his insurance businesses are worth anything near the amount of money he's claimed, and it's very hard to see where he was able to get this amount of money to, to plunge into the Brexit referendum. Uh, we, did, we did a really interesting story at the start, of la uh, kind of early la earlier last year, in early 2018, where um, Aaron Banks, just after, I think it was kind of around 2017, he said that he'd, he had a diamond mine in Lesotho, which is a small, tiny landlocked country in southern, in southern Africa, surrounded by South Africa. And he had a diamond mine, he'd found a huge diamond, and he's going to use this diamond to bankroll another UKIP, a new political party. And this got, and this got reported everywhere, and it was like, Aaron, Aaron Banks is going to fund this new party with a diamond from Lesotho. No one asked, well, I, I had actually been to Lesotho, so I was like, Lesotho diamonds? I didn't know there was diamonds in Lesotho. It's, like it's, really, it's, a, it's a very poor landlocked country, which, and also it's, the Orange River rises in Lesotho. And I'm not a, a diamond expert, but nobody di normally diamonds end up at the end of the river, not the start of the river. You know, the river creates the diamond as it, goes, as it flows out. That's why Angola is very rich in diamonds, because it's where the Orange River meets the, uh, meets the sea. Um, and I was like, that's very odd. So um, myself and some colleagues started uh, looking into this, and this, I discovered that... Uh, not only was this, uh, a leading archaeologist said that this diamond was geologically impossible. Uh, the world expert on Lesotho diamonds said the diamond is geologically impossible, which is quite impressive to find a geologically impossible diamond. <laughs> and um, I also found out that uh, Aaron Banks ran a political consultancy called Chartwell Political, and that Chartwell Political had been doing work in Lesotho, fair enough. Um, the Times, Aaron Banks, and kind of before the Brexit vote, had been bigging up his work in Lesotho. But I discovered that rather, normally political consultancy works like Someone consultant does work for your political party and you pay them. Aaron Banks was actually paying the party in the suit that he was doing the consultancy for uh, into, into a bank that was in the, in the leader's name, a private bank account in the leader's name, which is quite unusual. Um, uh, so kind of, again, more questions. And actually, to be honest, a lot of the stories I'm telling you about, there's, there's more questions than answers in some of them. Uh, we also looked into his offshore banking accounts and discovered that there was a lot of questionable transfers of money going on, uh, and it wasn't clear, uh, you know, it wasn't clear at all uh, where where the money for his uh, where the insurance where his insurance bu business had really made money. And back in 2013, 2014, it seems as if Aaron Banks was technically insolvent. Yes, three years later, he's able to spend 10 to 14 million pounds on a Brexit vote. And I guess the question is, you know, still the question is where did that money come from? Um, Leave.eu and Aaron Banks have actually, been, they've, a lot of regulators have been going after them. So they got fined £70,000 for breaching electoral law. Uh, Liz Billing, the CEO of Leave.eu, was reported to the Met Police. They were fined by the Information Commissioner's Office for breaching data protection. Uh, they, were using, um, they were using the insurance business, which take it, which seems to have been uh, involved with uh, using data that had been involved in the political process. Probably most significantly, the Financial Conduct Authority, which is uh, the Financial Conduct Authority, um, um, has been looking at them, and there's also um, the the NCA, the National Crime Agency, which is the highest police force in the United Kingdom. They are also investigating Aaron Banks, and that's after the Electoral Commission referred Aaron Banks to the National Crime Agency. And this all looks good; it looks like something's happening, but. Not, they, again, the Electoral Commission initially looked at Aaron Banks and said there was nothing to see here. They, they initially gave him a clean bill of health, said, that's all fine, there's no problem here. And it was really just the journalism of a few people. I, you know, we were doing it, Carol Cardwaller, The Guardian was doing it, some people at the FT, who kept this issue going. Otherwise, there would almost certainly nobody would have asked any more questions. And we also know that Aaron Banks met Russian officials multiple times before the vote, and there's been a lot of questions about, about Mr. Banks' relationship with Russia. Um, I'll just talk you through some of the stories here as well, because I know you're interested in data and that's the kind of thing you've been looking at as well, and the political process. So some of the stuff I've been doing around Aaron Banks has been uh, looking at kind of some of the data he's been using, the data he was able to access. And um, we did a big story a couple of months ago where I'd spent a lot of time this summer going up and down to Bristol, because Leave.eu is based in Bristol in a place called Lysander House, 
which is quite a grim uh, kind of uh, office block on the outskirts of Bristol, and it's where uh, Aaron Banks's quote unquote uh, insurance empire is run out of. Uh, and I met a lot of the people who worked for, um, for Leave.eu, who were often quite young kind of kids who'd been involved at Leave.eu. Leave uh, and I also spoke to people who'd been working for his insurance company, Eldon. And Aaron Banks had always said that all these different companies were totally separate. He had an insurance company, he had his politics company, but there was no overlap between these. And he went to Parliament and he said, no, these, there's nothing to do with these. Uh, these, uh, these companies are all totally separate. There was no data going from one company to the other. And to be honest, this is, he just lied. This is just not the truth. The reality is these companies were all intermixed with one another. Um, and there, was a lot, there seems to have been evidence that there was data being uh, used from one to the other. Um, so you have this email here from a woman called Pamela Palmer who worked for Leave.eu, but she was also a member, she actually worked for Eldon Insurance. So you can see quite clearly there's a, an overlap, but also you can see, you know, I've been asked to send some additional data to you, one million phone numbers and the members' data. I'm still working on phone numbers, but please see attached data for Leave.eu members. Um, you know, this is, there are a lot of, it's a lot of information. It's not clear where, where these one million phone numbers came from, what exactly they, they were been done with. And I've spoken, people I spoke to who worked in the Leave.eu call centres were saying that they were, uh, they were asking where is the data, they were, they were making calls, where does this data come from? And they were told, oh, it just came from Facebook and don't ask any more questions. So huge, huge questions about where all this came from. The Information Commissioner's Office is still looking at it, but this is two and a half years later, we're just about to leave the European Union, we still don't know exactly what was going on. Um, and I also discovered that uh, one of the interesting things we did was I, uh, we, myself and my colleague Jenna, we FOI'd all of the councils in the UK to get their electoral role. So every council has an electoral role, which is all the data of the electors in, in this certain area. And back in the day, that was kind of just, it's a big load of, you know, it's a big load of information and it would have been paper format and not that useful. But nowadays it's actually really useful. It's a huge amount of data. And what you can do, what's interesting is you can take disparate bits of data and stick them together. I'm sure somebody's told you this over the last few days. So you can take data from one source, take the electoral roll, data from something else like Experian, which will allow you to buy data, other types of data you might have yourself and, and put them together to create a really much more broad idea of who, who, your, who your target audience is. And it allows you to target ads and to kind of, uh, to target them in ways that you just couldn't do before. And what we discovered was that Leave.eu, but also Grassroots Out, which is a, another campaign connected to Leave.eu, and another thing called Goal Movement, which is again another kind of ginger group connected to these. And we, we had been asking for the electoral roll from all over the United Kingdom. Um, and they were, what was most interesting in some respects about that is that uh, this, they were using this electoral data after the Brexit referendum. So I, I spoke to people who worked in, in, in these call centres and they had to come back after the referendum and spend weeks crunching all this data uh, and formatting it so it all looked the same. And why they were doing this is still not clear. Uh, this is after the vote. Um, and this is an interesting email talking about uh, Aaron is Aaron Banks, Liz is Liz Billney, the CEO of Leave.eu, and they're talking about uh, in line with the big data project. Uh, so again, um, it's just not, it's not, all, it's not altogether clear what they were doing with all this data, but it's quite clear. Uh, and this is from September 2016, that email. So it's long, that's three months after the Brexit vote. Uh, there's still personal data and we're not sure where that data is, but potentially the data of, of tens of millions of people. And now we come on to uh, the subject that everyone's kind of interested in, uh, Cambridge Analytica. Um, and this is a man called Alexander Nix, you might have seen on your TV last year, running away from Channel 4 News and anybody else who was trying to talk to him. Um, and Alexander Nix was the head of, Ca of Cambridge Analytica. And Al Adam will talk more in specifics about Cambridge Analytica and where they come from. But What's interesting, I guess, in, the con in connection with, uh, with the referendum campaign is uh, Cambridge Analytica, in his book, The Bad Boys of Brexit, which is Aaron Banks's, well, written pretty much by Isabel Oakeshott, uh, Aaron Banks, uh, The Bad Boys of Brexit's his account of, um, of the Brexit referendum. It's fascinating reading. In a, uh, it's one of the worst books I've ever read in terms of how it's written. It's terrible. And I've read it so many times, it's so depressing. <laughs> and the book I've read most probably in my entire life is Aaron Banks, The Bad Boys of Brexit, which is just depressing. But it's got lots of useful information in it because um, it was written just after the Brexit vote and there's quite a lot of boasting and whatnot. And he talks in that book about how they'd hired Cambridge Analytica to do some work for him. Subsequently, the Leave.eu said that they'd never paid Cambridge Analytica and the work didn't go very far. And that was, but earlier this year, we broke the story of how uh, Steve Bannon, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, but Steve Bannon, kind of eminence grease behind the Trump campaign, that Steve Bannon, who was also involved with Cambridge Analytica, had actually introduced Aaron Banks and Cambridge Analytica back in 2015, about seven months before the Brexit vote. Uh, we, um, or maybe seven or eight months, uh, we discovered that there was emails with Steve ba Aaron Banks 
So it's Aaron Banks emailing, uh, Steve Bannon's email is there, uh, and they're talking about what they're going to do. They're saying, like, Congrat please have this meeting with each other, and uh, what can we do? They talk, um, Aaron Banks is saying, could you help us to fundraise in the United States, which is a strange thing to do because you're not allowed to spend money uh, that comes from outside the UK in British politics. But uh, it shows a connection between Aaron Banks and Steve Bannon and also Cambridge Analytica that seems to be more, uh, there seems to be a deeper connection than this idea that they just kind of met each other once and Cambridge Analytica didn't do any work for them. Um, and what we were also able to discover was that Cambridge Analytica, uh, so the Information Commissioner's Office, as part of their investigation, looked at uh, leave.eu and Cambridge Analytica and they said, look, they had four meetings and never went anywhere. Uh, through the emails, we were able to discover that there actually had been more meetings, and they, dis and they discussed quite specific things. They discussed something called target audience analysis, uh, which is quite an interesting process, uh, using uh, data from UKIP, but also from leave.eu, and it's about building audiences. It's about figuring out what your audience looks like, and then using Facebook and other tools, you're able to build what's called lookalike audiences, so you can target other audiences um, to find out, to, to kind of create uh, a kind of a political, uh, a political advertising uh, scenario, which you would want, you can kind of you can focus your adverts on specific uh, uh, people. And we, this again was kind of new, and I was surprised because the Information Commissioner's Office had investigated this, but they they hadn't actually found loads of these meetings, and they hadn't found what was going on about it. Which again it raises red flags about how successful our regulation is. I'm not sure what else I've got here. Uh, I won't talk much longer. We did it. We also did a lot of work on the European Research Group, who have become quite popular now. Jacob rees Mogg's crowd. Uh, and also think tanks, uh, which I think are really interesting as well. Uh, think tanks are kind of a big part of how politics is done in the United Kingdom at the moment as well. So yeah, that's that's a kind of overview of all the different work we've been doing over the last uh, couple of uh, couple of years.